Welcome to Parenting Teens with Dr. Cam, where we tackle the challenges of raising teenagers without the drama. I'm your host, Dr. Cam. Let's get on with the show. Hello, parents of tweens and teens. As the new school year approaches, prepping our tweens for success is more important than ever. Today, we're going to dive into some of the biggest challenges parents face, balancing expectations and pressures, navigating social dynamics, and setting up accountability for our tweens' academic success. Our special guest, Joanne Schaff, is here to provide our expert insights. Joanne, often called the parent whisperer, recently published her book, Loving the Alien, How to Parent Your Tween. She founded Your Tween and You to support, empower, and inspire parents through these challenging years. Joanna is going to share some valuable tips and actionable advice to ensure all of our tweens have their best school year yet. Joanne, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's so fun to be here. It is. So let's just, I love to start with the backstory. So what inspired you to start helping parents and their tweens? Queens. So this is uh, this has been coming for a while. So I was a school counselor, and um, at the time when all the cell phones were coming, the thing, parents were just like tearing their hair out. There, it was already the normal tween stuff where the kids were hibernating in their rooms, and parents were feeling kind of a loss because they weren't as involved in middle schools as they were in elementary schools, and. At one point, Dr. Cam, I had more parents in my office than I had students because Mm -hmm. they didn't know what to do with this technology. And then as I got talking to them, there were a whole bunch of other things they didn't know. So I thought, they need a book. They need a book to really figure out some great tools and strategies and understand all the stuff that's going on with their tweens. So that's how it started. A very big need indeed. So I'm glad you're filling this. And I do, and it's interesting because we're we're in the middle of summer right now. By the time this releases, it'll be closer to school, but things are already, people are already starting to panic about school (laughs) and getting ready. So what are some of the biggest challenges you see parents, like what were parents coming to you about? What were their biggest challenges? So in terms of technology, it hasn't changed because- it's the sites that they're on and the time that they're spending and the parents, I mean, shortly before that, maybe even 15 years ago, you know, it was all the rage to have your computer in a shared area in the home so that you could see what your kids were doing. Right. And then we just go from this really observant post to handing them the whole machine. Yeah. And no one knew the rules. No one knew what to do. Parents hadn't had cell phones either. So there was no like, historic information coming down. So we had to write a playbook to really help them do that. Yeah. And, and <laughs> what are what are some of the biggest things about the technology that they're that they're struggling with that's causing challenges? I mean, it is really all sorts of things from stranger danger to getting addicted to video games to taking that phone with them to bed and talking to all their friends the entire time that they're in bed, texting and so forth. So of course, you know, we know that sleep makes a big difference. And if you're on your phone all night, that that was just one of the big problems. And so really helping parents decide that they could have some control over their children's use of that telephone. And now, I mean, we parents have to think about that too, because how much time are we spending? What kind of example are do we have for that? And it's hard to say, you know, so oftentimes we'll get caught saying, do as I tell you, not do as I do, right? (laughs) All the time, all the time. (laughs) And so I I, I try to help parents really be a good example for their kids too. But I mean, just one little machine has upended our society completely, right? The way we do things. It it has. And it, it, I mean, upended sounds, it's changed it. Like it's changed it. And I'm still, I don't know if it's, I think so many people see it as the negative, Um, but I think that's because we've lived a life different. It's different. And Mm -hmm. so what parents see as different seems bad. And what I'm seeing in my practice is a lot of the conflict and pressure during school. There's really two things. It's the pressure to constantly succeed, succeed. Like parents want kids to get A's in every single class, regardless of what their strengths are or their interests are or anything else. And they want them to just not be on their phone at all and focus on homework. 
And the biggest challenge I see with that is a lot of the kids use their technology for homework, even if it's sitting there with their friend on FaceTime, so they're not bored and sitting by themselves. And so when the phones are removed, this actually causes more, a lot of other issues rather than just not having it. So I really want to talk to you about how do we find this balance so that our kids can stay focused and prioritize getting their work done, but also we're not in constant battles about the phone. Well, that's, I mean, that's the big thing to not make it a battle because once you create that conflict and there's, you're going to, and I'm not going to, and you're going to, and I'm not going to, no one is ever goes away happy. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so one of the things that I really value parents doing is collaborating with their kid instead of laying down the rules and you're going to be on it from this time to this time. And it's going to be in the kitchen charging all the other time. And I mean, 100% distrust, 100% authoritarian. And it's just not a good idea because the more we tell any adolescent no, the more they are going to want to do whatever it is. It's just human nature, right? It's humans, not teens. Humans. Everybody. (laughs) Let's be real. The value of collaborating is schools. This is, this is what a conversation could sound like. School's going to start. You've had a lot of freedom with your technology during the summer, but you know, we need to tighten that up. So let's, could we, is it possible for us to have a conversation and set it up so that you and I aren't battling all the time? Yeah. And so that's an invitation, right? Well, I think Joanne too, the the thing that I, parents often miss interpret that as is we're going to sit down and have a conversation and I'm going to tell you what the rules are and you're going to listen to the rules. Tell me, Joanne, why that is not going to work. <laughs> because they don't want to be bossed around. They don't want to be told what to do. And they are at the age where they're trying to figure out who they are, their identity, right? And part of that is what they believe in. Do they trust themselves? Who are they going to be when they grow up? What kind of friends do they have? How hard are they going to work work in school? So they've already got a lot going on in that brain processing all these things. And one of the things, two of the main things they want is independence and autonomy. And when you say to an adolescent, this is the way it's going to be, they are going to be like, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, except for those few that are going to obey no matter what out of some reason. Well, and then they come to me and complain about it. So they obey, but they're not happy it's about not, it. Yeah. It's not. Or they get sneaky. Right. And so I think for parents to understand that their kid really wants to say, their child really wants to say in their life. And as parents, we need to be wise enough to let that rope go, to let them have a bunch of, a little bit of control as time goes on, because they're going to be grown and flown and away at 18 or 21. And if they don't know how to balance already all the things in their life, they're going to be really up in a bad way when they're 18 or 21 and they don't know how to rein in their lives in certain ways. Joanne, I love that you brought that up because I think this is one of the biggest issues I hear with parents is if I let them have any control at all, they're just going to be on their phones all the time and their grades are falling. And do I just sit there and let them, let their grades fall? What do I, what do I do? So I really think that collaborating is the best thing. Like how can we, this is a, an invitation to your child. How can we make this work for both of us? I don't want to be the bad guy. I don't want to be mad at you all the time. And I don't want you to be in trouble. And I don't want your phone to be the source of everything that you do. That's not right. I take it away. Let's just try and erase that. And so when you, when you have that invitation, they do feel a glimmer of hope that maybe they, maybe my mom and dad really mean this invitation. Yeah. I think it's interesting because when you talk to teens and to, and tweens, middle schoolers too, they're very aware that the phone is a distraction. In fact, a lot of times they're so bored with the schoolwork that they turn to the phone because they're bored, not they're on the phone so they ignore the schoolwork. And I think right. we often mistake, we, we remove the phone, but we haven't made the homework any less boring. So they're gonna find something else to do. So right. removing the phone doesn't solve that. But I, I think the other thing is we have to be very clear with them on what they use the phone for. Because right. we can't equate screen time, all screen time is not equal. 
Mm -mm. No, not at all. Not at all. And that makes a big difference in when you when you're having that conversation with your child to really say, this is what I want to trust you with. These are the apps that I'm okay for you to use. And since I'm the one that's paying for that phone, I get to see whatever it is you're doing on that phone. And they are not going to like that one bit, but it's, it's like, you know, they, you pay for the house and you pay for their transportation and you pay for their dance lessons and you pay for their um, fees for going to a tournament. Right. And so that phone is really owned by the parents. And so in essence of I'm going to rent this to you, I'm going to let you use this, but it really belongs to me. And so it's a shared device and they're not going to like that either. And it's not that the parent doesn't trust them. It's that the parent just needs to know that they're safe and safety is such a huge thing for parents. Yeah. So I think this is, this is one of those fine lines that you've got to walk very carefully because I agree with you. However, how we do it makes all the difference. Because right. if it's a like, this is my phone, I get to take it whenever I want and everything else. Well, that's hard because you, you gave it to them and they're having personal conversations with their friends. And a lot of the kids I talk to, they have nothing to hide, but they feel very responsible for their keeping their what their kid, friends are saying um, confidential. Right. And parents are taking it. So I've had this experience with my own daughter where I was like, well, I, I would like to look at this. And she got really upset. And I'm like, what are you hiding? And it turns out she wasn't. And I trust my daughter right. with everything. But it was more she was worried about her friends. So I right. think how we handle the entire phone, I want to get this back to academics and school, because I think this mm -hmm. is really important, because we want to create kind of this this expectation going into school of what that's going to look like. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? So the expectation is something that both us, both we're as parents are okay with, but our teens are okay with, or else they're not going to abide by it. Right. If it right. doesn't help work for them. They're right. not going to listen. No. Well, and the thing is that that communication is really important. And we, when we listen to understand what our kids are saying, what our purpose is to understand them and to get knowledge about how they feel and, and what they're doing and what their plans are, they are getting that communication tap, that communication line is all about that connection. And so when I'm not on my child all the time about you did this wrong, or you were on your phone too long, or you didn't do this, or you didn't do that that child is not going to feel very comfortable saying, Hey, you know, this kid was really bugging me at school today and I don't know what to do about it because yeah. they're, they're not feeling that comfort with their parents. And so it's a, it's incumbent upon us as the leaders to really forge that connection, to talk to your child in ways that they feel heard, that they feel listened to. And one of the things that I really like that goes along with that is having your child have a voice. Hmm. What does that look like? So the voice is, so say we're going to talk to them about their grades. You want to get back to academics. So school's coming. So last year, it's a fresh start. So that's the thing. It's a fresh start. It doesn't matter what happened last year. It didn't. What ha doesn't matter what happened two years ago. You get a fresh start. You get new teachers. You get new classes. You get to begin again. So whatever happened before doesn't really matter whether it's good or bad, you get a fresh start. And so when we get a fresh start, we get to have conversations like now that school's going to be coming, shall we talk about what grades you're going to get in each class? So instead of laying over this, I want you to get all A's and B's. When we ask the child, Hey, let's talk about what grade you think you can earn in math. Okay. And maybe math is their, their strongest subject. And they go, I can, I can get between a 95 and a 98 in math all year long, no problem. Okay. Yeah. Then you go down to language arts or English and they're like, you know, I hate writing. I don't like reading. None of these things come easy for me and I don't enjoy them. So as a parent, we have to realize that, that they excel at math and you yeah. want them to have that and you want them to do well, you want them to learn in English as well, but maybe that goal could be an 88 yeah. or an 85. So it's sort of like the idea where you have to pitch it where they can hit it. You know, yeah. we can't say we want you to get all A's and B's. It's much easier if we have a direct target, it's much easier to hit. So before school starts, I really suggest that parents sit with their tweens and say, 
let's talk about what your goals are going to be. And it's what your goals are going to be. That word is your, Mm -hmm. not my goals for you, but what your goals are going to be. And when they get to say, this is what I was talking about, the voice, I can do really great in math. I'm not so hot in language arts. So my goal, I want my goal to be lower there than 88. And so when we have reachable goals that they can actually achieve, it makes them much more successful and more motivated. Mm -hmm. And Joanne, I think this is really, it's important to check in a little bit further into the year too, because they're, if they make this goal before they've taken the class, know the teacher, know the work, it's hard. But I love this idea for going into middle school. Because one thing I have seen quite frequently is kids who do really well in elementary school, go into middle school, middle school is a whole lot tougher. And their courses are far more extreme in terms of what they're learning. And so this differentiation of I'm great in literature, but I'm not very great at science, that Mm -hmm. kind of comes out a little bit. And all of a sudden kids go, well, when I was a straight A student in grade school and now I'm not, I'm just now stupid. And they give up in everything, like across the board. If they can't get straight A's, then they're just not a straight A student. They give up. So I love this, like, let's identify the things where you love it, you're passionate about it, you're going to go full on in, and here's the things that, you know what, you got to learn it all, so here are the things that are going to be like, we're going to we're gonna work our best at these. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, you're so right about middle school because um, oftentimes in elementary school, kids can correct their work to get a higher grade, and so what they might, they might get maybe a 78 on something and they recorrect it and maybe they end up with an 88 or a 90. So in a way it's in the, it's an inflated grade in some regards because they've gotten to redo it and redo it, which I think is a great thing because that's all about learning, right? Mm. That second tier of learning, like, oh my gosh, if I had just put that period at the end of the sentence, I would have gotten full credit, right? Yeah. But that doesn't happen so much in middle school. They don't always get so many second chances. And so their grade often looks different than it was in elementary school. And that's such a hard hit for, for middle school kids. I was smart last year, but this year I'm not. Oh, I get that a lot. And kids just, their, their grades start to plummet because they start getting disenchantized and they're just like, I'm, I'm done. And I think the other thing is let's talk about, because uh, it drives me nuts when we focus so much on the grade because the message becomes it's the grade, not what you learn or the effort you put in towards the grade. And kids will cheat because it's about the grade. So right. if I can get it or I'm going to do the least amount I possibly can to get the grade and parents are like, why are you doing that? Because you're focused on the end result and not the process. So Joanne, talk to us about how do we help get our kids motivated. Let's get into intrinsic motivation, not the nagging. How do we dig dig into that when they go into middle school? Well, so one of the things that can really be helpful with that is when you make it about the grades, it's a, it's a big thing, right? But if you make it about the, the tasks that need to get that grade there, like what time, what time do you think you're going to do your homework? What, how's that going to work for you? How, what time are you going to have things turned in by? Because a lot of times now kids will just submit their homework online mm-hmm. and they will sometimes forget to do that. Mm-hmm. So, but it's all the building blocks. Like what does studying really look like? You know, is it, yeah. is it doing your homework? Is it reading a chapter? How is that? How are you going to do that? Because the success comes from all those skills, doing the homework, turning it in, putting it in your backpack, writing down the assignment when it's given in whatever way they want to do that. So all those things are going to contribute to their success. And without those bottom layers, those grades aren't going to happen. And so really helping parents understand that it's the building blocks mm. that need to be rewarded, that need to be, hey, my gosh, you're, you got all your homework done. You turned it in on time. Aren't you proud of yourself? You know, not I'm proud of you, but you've got to feel great about that because you talk about intrinsic motivation. It's all about the child feeling proud of themselves or even acknowledging what they do. Yeah. And not trying to please us. And I like the building blocks too, because I think we will, as parents will go, Hey, your grades are failing. You need to do better. And the kids, and I'll talk to the kids. I'm like, what do you, and they're like, I just need to do better. I'm like, what does that mean? 
what, what does is- do better mean? And let's look at what is what is getting in your way because you're right. The one thing I hear a lot, they do it, they forget to turn it in. Not because they're lazy or anything else. They're they they don't think of stuff like that at this right. age, right? So maybe it's like, okay, you do your homework and you forget to turn it in. So let's figure out a plan or let's try different techniques or strategies to see what works for you. I'm not going to tell you what to do because it might not work for you. What works for you to get your homework in in time? How mm-hmm. how can you remind yourself? Right. So I think one of the things that's really helpful for kids is when when they realize that they have to submit their homework and they've they've got a plan like they're going to do it at this time and do it at this time and then submit yeah. so it's like part of the organization of how it's done it just becomes yeah. a habit all yeah. of those things are all habit habits the the doing the work the writing it down etc and turning it in i mean it's just so sad for kids when they go to the trouble to do all that work and then they don't get credit or they lose a certain percentage of their credit because we yeah. want them to get that credit. We do when they make the effort. And I want to talk one thing about two. So one of the worst inventions personally, I think you might disagree with me is the ability for parents to check grades every single second of the day. Oh my! God. I find this to be absolutely horrific for the kids and for the parents because Parents start owning the grade and getting on it. And secondly, I've seen this over and over again. Teachers don't put the grades in right away. And all of a sudden I have kids that are getting in trouble for their grades when it's the teachers that haven't put it in yet. Right. So this has caused so when we talk about expectations and pressure, this has caused so much ridiculous, unfair expectations and pressure I, I just wish it would be removed. It, it is really crazy. And I'm, I remember before they had that, it, it was less stress for kids because mm-hmm. they weren't walking in the door and their mom wasn't saying, why did you get a C plus on that test? You studied so hard. You knew everything. How did yeah. that happen? How can a child even answer that question? What no. is the answer to that question? And so what I tell my clients to do with their children is this. You're going to make a deal with your kids when you're talking in the summer about what they're, what they want to earn, what they're going to earn, how that, what homework and all that is going to look like. You're going to make a deal with them that you will never, ever, ever open that grade portal. Yeah. But every week you'll sit down with brownies or ice cream or on a walk or whatever. And it's a set date and time and let the child open the portal and tell you that they have this grade and then they can, they're looking at it and they're like, oh my gosh, no wonder I have an 82 in, in social studies. I forgot to turn in that paper when I was sick. Oh my gosh. And then I, I'm going to have to ask the teacher if she'll make an exception and let me turn it in. And this is what ownership looks like. I'm so glad you agree with me. Um, with you 100%. Yeah. And it's all about ownership, Joanne. And that's the thing that I, and I hear, I, there was even something on the news today about people complaining about the Gen Z in the, in the workforce. And the problem that I keep seeing is parents take so much ownership of everything they do that kids never learn how to do it. Exactly. And send them in the world with great grades, but they're not their grades. And they haven't learned how to get those grades on their own. No. And they crumble. It's very sad. It's very, very sad because when we own something, we take care of it, right? You get a new car, you get some new dishes, you get some new jewelry or a new dress, and you're going to take care of it because you own it. Yeah. But that feeling of ownership is very powerful in terms of what kids are going to do with what they have. Yeah. And so when we, when, and I think it's scary for parents, especially kids who are on that line. Sometimes they're passing, sometimes they're failing, sometimes they're passing. And parents often feel if they're not the wind beneath their wings, they're not going to, the, the child's not going to pass. But that child mm-hmm. would probably do even better without the nagging. Like, just tell me what you're going to do. Yep. Tell me, tell me what you have for homework and tell me how you're going to do it. And that goes back to the voice of the kid saying, Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this first. You know, I hate math. I'm going to do it first and get it out of the way. I have to work on that project. So I'm going to do a little bit tonight. Oh, by the way, mom, I need you to go to the store and get whatever for me. 
And so <laughs> I and- need it today. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> yeah. But what they, yeah, there is always, oh, can you just stop what everything you're doing? and Go, to- <laughs> go run to the store and get this stuff. <laughs> exactly. But again, it's their voice speaking yeah. what they're going to do. And that is very powerful. Very, it's very powerful. hundred percent. And I have seen that with my daughter who is this, who has the great grades and then horrific grades. Um, and she's always owned it. And now it's like her ability to problem solve and motivate herself and do all of that is astounding to me. She's better at it than I am now. How old is she? She's now 18. Okay. Um, so she takes full charge of everything in her life now. And it's pretty phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but she's had ownership her whole life. Because and, she gave it to her. Yeah. And that included ownership to fail. It yeah. included that. And it was always something where if it didn't work, there wasn't a punishment for it. It was a problem solving. Let's figure this out. It's okay. We're going to figure right. it out. And now she can problem herself her way out of a box. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, you've done a great job. Well, I've been focused on that. So, <laughs> and I encourage parents, and I think parents have so much difficulty letting go, and it's fear. They have so fear. much fear of what's going to happen if they let go. And I want to put more fear in them if they don't let go. <laughs> That's scarier because your kids aren't going to have the skills. Yeah, they're not going to have the skills. And, you know, when you were talking about middle school earlier, that is a great time to experience failure because what failure really is, and I think some people don't understand this, it's an opportunity to learn. It's a mistake and we get to learn. What would you do differently? Mm -hmm. Okay, you didn't study for the test. You didn't do well on the test. So there's no punishment for that. There's no punitive measure. There's like, if you could do it over, what would you do? Yes. If you could go back in time two days before the test, what would you do? And that's when they can say, I would have started reviewing my notes. I would have started practicing the problems. I would have, whatever they would have done. And then, okay, so you'll probably do that next time, right? And they'll say, yes. Yeah. And so that whole thing about solving a problem and thinking about, hey, if I could do it over, I would do whatever. Even when they get a test back and they say, oh my gosh, how did I do that? How did that happen? And then they look through it and they're like, oh. So I did this workshop for some teachers uh, last year before school started. And it was about second tier learning, like how they learn from mistakes. Mm. And I was asking these teachers, so when you hand back their test, what happens? And they said, well, we just go on to the next thing. And I'm like, what about learning what they didn't learn? What about yeah. capturing more information? And so when I talked to them about second tier learning, they were like, oh my gosh, I'm going to start doing that because it's so valuable. Yeah. It's so valuable. It, it is amazing when they get to do that. And then when they don't fear failure, right? So if they're getting in trouble for failure, that's basically saying failing is bad. So now I'm shame, ashamed if I fail, I hide if I fail, I lied if I fail, or I find any other way around it. It's not motivating or solving the problem. No, this no. is, we're going to solve the problem, learn from it. So now I don't fear failure. Now I'm like, I'm excited to try new things. Exactly. Out. Okay. Trying new things is so awesome for, for middle school kids. And I think sometimes Parents just need a little bit of a re- reminder that failing is in middle school is not going to keep them from getting into Harvard Law School. No. And ha- and getting into Harvard Law School is not going to guarantee them a beautiful, perfect life. No. <laughs> <laughs> like not everyone is made for Harvard Law School. Right. So I, I think we got to also really think, you know, when you were sa- talking about the strengths too, because I know with when, when they're learning, like not all kids learn the same way. So if there's like, they took a history test and they didn't do well in it rather than being like, Oh, go study again. Like go find a cool movie about it or go find a book about it or go do a game, like anything where they start learning about it. And all of a sudden it's like, I mean, with my daughter, if you have a Broadway show about it, she's going to know it for life. (laughs) There you go. She knows all about whatever (laughs) Hamilton is. Even if it's not accurate, she knows that. So, you know, it's like, let's learn, find ways that they learn. That that's a great idea. That is a really great idea because kids love to learn from videos for the most part and hands-on learners. 
like, you know, you didn't, you didn't get something right. Well, show me what it looks like. Yeah. You're like, oh yeah, I can, I can build a model of that. So, and I think one, uh, one thing that happens is, is kids are very rarely aware that they are like a hands-on learner or they learn by listening or they learn by reading. But once they know that, and the parent knows that, that really helps them help your child learn in a way that, that, that works for them. Yeah. The other thing that's cool, and this goes back to kind of the videos, is that I know a lot of kids who are not interested in some of the stuff they learn in school, but they will spend hours learning in depth topics through YouTube and they will know, they will become experts in something through YouTube. So I, I will also encourage parents to go, if the kids are struggling in school, rather than worrying that they're not very smart or they're going to struggle, go, what are they interested in? And are they motivated there? Because if they're motivated there, then your kid is a motivated kid. Right. Yeah. I can tell you when my, um, I had, I had four kids and they were, they were a little bit of everything. Right. So I had one that really struggled in school. And I mean, he really struggled. He's a great kid. He's outgoing and friendly, has a million friends, but grades were never his thing. And so, but he was a really great little scrappy hockey player and Mm -hmm. he loved hockey and he did well in hockey. And so he got to play hockey no matter what his grade report said. Thank you. And he, um, he was like, mom, or my other kids were like, that's not fair. You know, if we don't pass, well, they always pass. So it was never, we don't pass. Yeah. But they just thought that was a little unfair that he got to do this, even though he wasn't always passing everything. And I'm like, you know, you, you always want to have time and get to do what you're good at. Yeah. Let's get to do what you're good at. And, um, I think that did a lot for my relationship with him because he knew that I understood his struggles in school and he also knew how great he was in hockey and that I wanted to encourage that for him. So I think that's something for parents to think about is what are other ways to measure your child's success outside of a grade report? Uh, I love that because I think we get so narrow focused on grades are the only thing that they can achieve at this age and we miss all this other stuff that they're developing and playing hockey has nothing to do with grades like why would you take that away that's basically saying anything else about you is not important unless you do this and if you're bad at this then you're just a sucky person rather than this is where you might not be strong but look how strong you are here exactly if you don't do stuff that you love during the day you're not going to have the energy and motivation to do tough stuff like school. Right. Yeah. And I see that a lot too, where kids, everything that they enjoy is taken away. They have no dopamine going to the head and brain. They're just like completely in a, in like stress mode. And then they're being yelled at to do their homework. I'm like, it doesn't work well. You're, you're no. setting them up to fail. No, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I hate being yelled at. I mean, it was just, I still hate being yelled at. <laughs> it's not fun. It's just so disrespectful. And so that's one of the things I try to get help parents understand is that their tone of voice, like when they, I I tell them, okay, so you're going to lay into your child because they, you know, their room isn't clean and grandma's coming. Right. And I told you to do it and, and blah, 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 blah. And so I tell them after two sentences your child knows if you're going to lecture them if you're going to listen to them the kind of mood that you're in and they can turn you off mm-hmm. and they can stand there and look like they're listening but they are thinking about their the new song that's coming out or the youtube video they want to watch so when you want to make a difference talking to your child that voice cannot be the voice of lecture or mm-hmm. i'm right and you're wrong and i'll tell you why that's yeah. my least favorite. I'm right. You're wrong. And I'll tell you why. Right. Because I'm the parent. And, and I think what's hard is we see that when they're not listening as a sign of disrespect. And I think it's more of a feeling disrespected is exactly. what's still happening. It's not them disrespecting you. It's them feeling disrespected and protecting themselves. That's exactly right, Dr. Yeah. Kim. So I, I think how we perceive that. So, okay. Joanne. Yes. <laughs> they're going to school. We've covered a lot. What are the top three things that you want to make sure parents are walking away with from this episode? So I really want them to to realize the value of their child's voice and 
by listening to them and listening to understand them. And then the next thing I really want them to, to do is to set up these accountabilities for their success. Number one, letting them decide what their grade goals will be. And second of all, looking at that portal with them opening it and sharing their stories with you because you want the stories. I mean, the data is great, but you want the story. You want to find out why they didn't have to take that test. And it's because Mrs. Perkins didn't get the copies made. And so they didn't have to take it. Right. That's a great story to learn about, right? You don't learn about that as a parent opening the portal. So I think that's the what, the second thing. And then the really, the other thing I really like is focusing on your child's strengths. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I had my daughter loved animals. She loved them. I mean, any dog, cat, pet, turtle, anything. She was a friend to that. And so I think she was in seventh grade. And I said, let's see if you can volunteer at the vet's office and just offer to, to be in the office. And so, of course, the vet said yes. And she wanted to be a vet. That was in her heart. She knew she would be a vet. And so after a couple of weeks, the, um, the vet said, she called me and she goes, Joanne, I'm going to have Crystal with me as I open up this dog's paw to remove something and the dog will be asleep. And, um, so, I'm, and is that okay with me? And I'm, of course, you know, that's what yeah. she wants to do. We got to get her in there. Right. She fainted. Oh, my daughter fainted. Yeah. She couldn't stand the blood No. But in seventh grade. Then she knew that she wasn't going to be a vet. She could still volunteer and she could you still know. do dog rescue and things like that. But she knew that she couldn't be a vet. And that was a powerful learning experience because that was her interest. And so I think when we think about how can we forge our child's interests, how can we get them involved in things to find out and hone their skills? Maybe she hadn't done that and she would be a vet today, but it was a powerful learning experience. Yeah. And when we think about what our kids' strengths are, we can help them grow. And focusing on those strengths are really, really awesome. And when they are moving towards something they are passionate about, the amount of motivation and passion and drive can be incredible. If exactly. they are dragging their heels and not and resistant, they're probably not going towards something they're passionate about. No, no, not at all. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for having me on today. Thank you so much, Joanne. I appreciate it very much. Yeah. I just want to say for um, parents, I do have a book out called, um, I can show it to you here, Loving the Alien, How to raise your tween and it has it's every chapter starts with a story that every parent will identify with and then there's lots of um strategies and skills that you'll learn to just make life with your tween much more enjoyable that's fantastic we'll put a link in the show notes to make sure everyone can find that okay. joanne thank you so much for joining us on the show thank really you. it was my you. pleasure have a great day you too and that's a wrap Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Parenting Teens with Dr. Cam. Don't forget to hit follow so you don't miss a single episode and share the love by passing this on to a friend. Until next time, keep making a positive impact in your teen's life.